Welcome everyone. Welcome to today's workshops by Datastax developers. Today is about building a multiplayer real-time game with Astro Streaming. Uh, my name is Stefano, nice to meet you. I am a developer advocate at Datastax. I like distributed systems, I like coding, I like software architecture, and I like Apache Cassandra. And, which will be relevant later, I like spiders. So this is the agenda for today, uh, practical instructions. Then we will look at messaging systems. We will speak about storage, which will make the game even more, uh, even richer. We will um, speak a bit more about the Astro Streaming, that is basically Apache Pulsar, which is a particular messaging system. Then we will look into how the game works, how the, the game is structured. We will make it run, we will play with it, and then we will conclude. So there is a lot to cover and let's start. First, practical information, uh, how to get the most out of this workshop. Today we are going to use a lot of tools. Of course, there is a GitHub repository with the source code of today's game, uh, exercises, and you will also find this very slide deck for you. We are going to use an IDE which runs in the browser which is Gitpod, and it's basically a browser version of uh, Visual Studio Code, which provides everything for you uh, in the cloud, as in the browser, uh, including running the code. So there is nothing to install. Everything today will be made in your browser. In your browser. Um, as for backend tools, we are going to use a messaging system, of course, an event streaming solution based on Apache Pulsar, which is uh, Astro Streaming, which wraps Pulsar as an offering, uh, as a service, basically, as a cloud service. And in the same spirit, we are going to use a database, which is built on Apache Cassandra, and that will be uh, that is AstroDB, offered uh, again for free. Uh, at least there is a very high-level free tier for you to use today. That's not it. And that's not all there is to it, because if you really want to get serious, uh, there is a badge, a badge that uh, a verified, verifiable badge that. Uh, proves you attended the workshops and did the homework, because after the, the, the workshop, you can do a bit of homework and you can then submit. There is a form for submission in the GitHub repository README, and you will be able to get your nice badge. Event streaming. We have a lot of badges, so you can feel free to visit, to explore our uh, GitHub uh, uh, account. There is a lot of there are a lot of topics covered, so go ahead and it's great. Okay, that being said, let's start gaming. So let's start with the most important feature of today's game, that is messaging systems. So what engine will power the game? What kind of game we have in mind? Well, it's a multiplayer game and it is real time. So very generally, the kind of architecture we have in mind is there are clients that connect to a single server and they exchange uh, messages. In particular, the clients will send player actions, such as the, the player moving or whatever kind of action the player on the client side might do, to the server. The server receives this information from all clients, does some things like updates its internal state, does some calculation, validates the, the actions, whatever, and it sends out to every connected client updates on what happened in the shared game world, so that every client is able to update its knowledge of the world and, let's say, basically refresh the screen, for example. Now, in this, uh, in this uh, sketch, there is a central server, and these things that you see uh, representing the clients are the all-time uh, arcade machines, if you don't know what they are, congratulations, you are young. <laughs> Message communication. So uh, client sending information to the server. Okay, that's something that we know can be done in various ways. There is the typical uh, request response pattern. Let's say web architecture is based on that. But we want to get real time. So a uh, basic idea would be the clients, every connected clients constantly polls the server, is there something new and wait a bit? Is there something new and wait a bit? So this is what is called polling. Uh, this is a bit of an old time solution for a 
various for various reasons this is not ideal because um well there is a lot of overhead establishing every time a new connection there is anyway a bit of latency because you have to sleep a bit before the next polling uh, action and the the more you the, the higher the frequency of polling, the higher the chance that you are wasting time because there is nothing new to get. So it's really not what we want, right? We want something better when it comes to uh, exchanging information back and forth between client and server. So ideally, instead of these curly arrows representing the client constantly asking, actively asking, we want something like this. We want that every time a new information, a new, let's say, the update of a player position gets to the server, the server actively sends this information, broadcasts this information out to all connected clients actively from the server side. So instead of the request response client initiated, we want something that is starting from the server that actively pushes data. That means we want a messaging platform. We want a, a platform that acts as a relay for messages in as a real-time fashion as possible. So what is called push instead of pull. So this is what we mean by a messaging platform. Okay, now before we go on, uh, when I say messaging platform, messaging system, I do not mean like sending SMS uh, through your cell phone. And when I say streaming, I do not mean sitting in your couch, relaxed, watching a film. We mean um, messaging platform is basically a backend service that is able to route and convey data between backend systems. This kind of data is usually available progressively. As it comes available, it is relayed through these messaging systems. And usually it is coming in small packages, small packets of information, uh, which we usually call events. Okay, that being said, messaging systems are uh, a solution to many problems. In particular, they address the problem, they address the desire to have non-blocking communication. So uh, I want to relay my message and then I just want to do something else. And this message is dispatched and I don't care anymore and it will eventually get to uh, the desired destinations. It is, as we said, based on the desire of uh, the server pushing data and not the client having to constantly pull or pull. Uh, messaging systems, modern messaging systems, also address the issue of the coupling, of having a loose coupling between the entities who create the messages and the entities who, has, who have to receive them. And then we want to have a real time or anyway, a fast response to new data arriving. And this is as opposed to, you know, like, batched analysis or periodic batches running every night and crunching a whole day of new data that has accumulated since last run, for example. This kind of decoupling is a good match with the modern uh, uh, microservice kind of architectures, of course. Now, mm, messaging systems basically receive messages or events, receive events on one side and deliver them on the other side. So, uh, as we said, they uh, implement, they embody a decoupling between, as opposed to direct communication between sender and receivers, uh, also allowing for uh, having cross language. So you, have, you can have microservices or anyway, two, event, two entities that uh, speak a totally different language, as long as they are able to connect with this message relaying system, this message uh, broker, basically. A, message, a modern message system acts as a buffer for communication. So uh, it sort of alleviates the problem of uh, buffers in the senders and in the receivers piling up too much because they can sort of uh, balance out. A modern messaging system or event streaming platform um, implements several patterns as, as when it comes to delivering messages. We will uh, shortly see a couple of them. And then, depending on which particular platform, there might be um, optional schemas on top of it, JSON, Avro, you name it. Okay. So, uh, messaging platforms are actually a very, um, a very uh, modern uh, piece of software. So, in a sense, if 10 years ago it was the golden age for 
big data, no SQL revolution and whatnot. Today, maybe the attention is even more on the need for live, real-time mass uh, data uh, analysis, real-time data handling. So let's say we are in a golden age for messaging services. Indeed, there have been a few uh, very notable um, software pieces of software software hand, uh, dealing with messaging. Uh, you probably are uh, familiar with Apache Kafka, that is still, I mean, the most uh, probably the most widely used messaging platform. But mo uh, even more recently, Apache Pulsar came out, and that's probably more modern in a few key uh, features. And messaging platforms address and cover several important use cases. Uh, so the idea is that messaging is a good solution when you have a data set that is never complete, like you have a constant influx of new events in a clickstream analysis. You probably want to have a ever running an analytics uh, platform going on and that, that so it stays up to date with everything that arrives anew. So you have a continuous stream of new events to process, or you want to implement a shared queue. So let's say there are items to process and they are they keep coming in and you want to consume these items to process for say expensive item by item computation. That's already, that's even one of the typical usages of messaging systems. In practice, this covers a lot of needs. So IoT needs, social media, car automation, there are all situations where you keep getting new points, new data points, basically in a never-ending constant stream over time. So finance, online gaming as today, right? Fraud detection, a lot of different uh, applications. Okay, so um, very schematically, a messaging system sits in the middle of this kind of structure. You have producers, one or more producers that are agents, whatever, some kind of agents, and they create new events, new messages, and they put them into the messaging system. And the messaging system, in turn, is able to deliver these events to one or more consumers. That's very abstract, but there is already something to be said. We want this messaging system to be able to deliver asynchronously. So once the producer has put the message in, in, the, system, in, the, in the event platform, the producer can do anything, something else, doesn't care anymore. And the messaging system will take care of delivery, which means that the messaging system has to implement some sort, some sort of uh, storage. So it has to retain messages and then maybe expire them later according to some policy that you probably usually have to configure or might want to configure. Not only that, but even just there are uh, subtleties connected to making sure messages are delivered to the correct uh, consumers because there might be crashes, there might be um, any kind of problem at the messaging system level or the consumer level. So usually uh, delivery is the most delicate part. For example, if you want to make sure every message is delivered only once, Usually that goes through a logic of the consumer having to actively acknowledge back to the acknowledge received or even just or even uh, not only having received the message but having processed it so to avoid you know that twice processing. Okay, so uh, I mentioned that usually modern messaging platforms implement several patterns for consuming messages. One of them is the queuing. So the shared queue pattern, you see it here. One or more producers create messages, create events in the topic. Uh, the topic is the usually, it, it, what the topic in a messaging system is a, a single pipe over which messages flow. So a, a messaging, a, an event streaming platform might have several topics. Each one usually specialized to convey one particular type of messages. This is, let's say, a, logic, a way to logically divide the, the operation of the messaging system to keep everything orderly, let's say. So producers write messages to a topic. You can think of this topic as an as a ordered uh, line of messages to consume. And maybe in the queuing pattern, in the shared queue pattern, the consumers each take care of... Uh, this joint part, subset of the messages. So let's say every message 
in the queue goes to exactly one consumer. So let's say this is an expensive computation that has to be done once per every new event that's coming in. So you can have several consumers sharing the load. And if they are not enough, you can usually add new consumers and they will just start dividing the messages among more, more uh, consumers than before. Uh, okay, so this might involve uh, out-of-order processing because consumers might fail. This, uh, on the other hand, is pretty easier to scale uh, out when you want to add new consumers. A sort of complementary consumption pattern is the pub-sub or fan-out uh, way of consuming messages. So again, we have producers who write messages, events to a topic, but then this time we want all consumers to receive all messages. So it's more like, you know, when many people subscribe to the feed of a celebrity on a social media. So every consumer will get all messages that flow through the topic. And that's working through a subscription. So every consumer subscribes to the topic and since that moment, it will start getting all messages. Now, this is useful because this is what we want for our game. Let's say we have a lot of clients connected to the game. The server knows how the world of the game looks like. And every time, let's say every time a single player makes a move, this has to be known and broadcast to all connected clients. So if each player has to receive every update to the shared game world from the, from the server side, this is the pattern we are going to use. So we want to use a PubSub way of delivering messages. Okay, now, um, there is a distinction to be made between databases and messaging platforms. Well, actually, there are many differences, but the most relevant one for us is that in a database, data is at rest. So data sits there in tables, in collections, depending how you call them. But basically, they are static places where the data sits there, waiting for you to query it, to retrieve it in several ways. In a messaging platform, the focus is on the data in transit. So data, messages, events, whatever, they just flow through and they are, as soon as they arrive, they, they are usually distributed to the correct uh, recipients. Uh, well, there are several other differences, such as, for example, usually in a database, you can have complex query patterns, not, not, more, not so usually in an event streaming platform. Uh, in a database, um, data do not disappear unless explicitly deleted, while in a messaging platform, there is usually a retention policy with a finite timeout or some other uh, criterion for automatic you know, uh, cleanup of old stale stuff. But my point is that the, the, the boundaries between the database and a messaging platform are are not even so well defined. So it's more like the kind of consum data consumption pattern that is more uh, suited to that system. Not only that, as we said, uh, message brokers, systems of delivering messages that retain messages, uh, have some kind of persistence. They have to for asynchronicity, for example. So there is a, a bit of database in, in event streaming platforms. Uh, but also the opposite is true, because most databases nowadays are equipped with what is called CDC, which is Change Data Capture, which means that a database usually offers a stream of events describing every change that happens to the database. In a way that you can say you can stay there listening to this stream of, of changes and just be able to basically reconstruct the status, the state of your database. That's useful, for example, to keep uh, derived data store aligned with the, with the actual database, the main database, the source of truth in a, in a precise way. And uh, that being said, a typical modern real-time data application usually needs both a messaging platform and a database. Uh, today's game also will. Okay, indeed, speaking of that, let's quickly uh, talk about storage. So how do we make the game richer with a bit of server-side storage, a bit of persistent storage on the, on the server side, on the API side? 
Okay, so uh, let's look, let's make a step back and look at a very simple game. We have a client. In the mind, in the memory of the client application, there is a knowledge of the game state. You see here in this balloon. Every time the client does something, there is uh, an event, a message going to the server. The server takes care of uh, basically broadcasting this information, maybe validating this information and broadcasting it to every connected client. So the message goes back to the clients. They will update their game state and you can play. So you say, you say that you see your, your player and the other player moving in, on the screen. Good. So that's it. So this is a bit of a simple game, right? because you can't have player-to-player -player actual interactions. You can have collision detection because only the clients know how the game looks like, how the world looks like at that very moment. But if we add storage, and this is this uh, database icon here, if we store the shape of the game world on the server in a database, then we can suddenly have a lot of fun, you see? Because, yes, the client will still keep memory of the game state, even just to be able to, you know, draw the screen. But this will not be the source of truth. The source of truth will be on the server side. And it will be the server that will do validations. Let's say it will prevent a player from running on top of another player. So collision detection, for example, because it knows how the game world looks like. So if we want to make a game richer, we need uh, to persist data on the server side. Nice. Now, there is a slight difference between what is on the database and what kind of messages flow through the game. They are sort of two sides of the same information, but they are stored in a conceptually different way. Because on the database, you might have something like you see here. Well, this is actually an, an actual query from the data stored in, in the database for today's game. So let's say, what is in the database? For a given game, you have a bunch of items. So there is a player, food items, uh, obstacles, and you have, in particular, the coordinate, the position in the world. So this is a snapshot of the current state of the game. And this will get updated as the game, goes, as the game uh, uh, is played. But the message, on the other hand, will look something like player A is in this position, player B entered the game, uh, there is food at this position. So it is individual events. What is the relation between those two, those two different ways of uh, describing the game? Well, you can imagine that if you listen to the stream of messages since the beginning of the game, you will be able to reconstruct the current snapshot. So the database status, the current database status is the result of basically listening to the whole stream of events um, until now and keeping track, updating a status. Indeed, uh, in this game, we, we treat the database as the main source of truth. And in a sense, the stream of messages is an additional description of the same thing, and it is written in a form that is useful for the clients to, to, to represent the game to the players. Uh, you can do a step further and switch to the philosophy called event sourcing, which sort of uh, switches roles, and it, it says the real thing, the truth, is the stream of events, and the database is basically uh, happens to be a cache of the latest values of everything. Indeed, uh, with a bit of uh, uh, informal writing, I like to call this fundamental theorem of event sourcing. So the philosophy of event sourcing is the real truth is in the stream of events from the beginning of time and the states I can want I can keep a state like in the database but this will be a byproduct indeed the state at a given time is just the result of every message since the beginning of time until that moment okay now today uh, uh, I reiterate today the truth will be the state on the database so no event sourcing proper but still the relation between events and and state uh, is uh, is always there, always holds. Now, 
Um, let's speak about Pulsar. Pulsar is the messaging system, the event streaming platform that we are going to use today. Well, actually, we are going to use Astro Streaming, but one thing at a time. So my point is that event streaming platforms are very hard, very complicated, very sophisticated pieces of software, especially if, and usually it is the case, you want them to not only be able to correct, correctly deliver messages, but also support failover, replication, maybe geographical replication. They want, you want them to be able to scale uh, if you need them to scale. So it's technically not easy. And it is inherently a distributed system if you want them to be you know, replicated and everything. Not only that, but also operations are a hard thing to do. Uh, if you ever had to uh, repartition a Kafka topic, you know uh, what I mean. So it's really not an easy thing. So today, not only we rely on an existing message platform, but we also use a version that is offered in the cloud. So no operations for you, it is no installation. It is just there as a cloud offering, and it's free. This is what I meant. So Apache Pulsar is one of the most uh, modern and uh, feature-rich uh, messaging platforms. So it is uh, born at Yahoo. Now it is uh, managed and maintained and developed by the Apache Foundation. It supports all the, the, the delivery, messaging delivery patterns I mentioned, so PubSub as well as Shared Queue. It has a lot of uh, features. We are just going to skip on them. Uh, but the important point, and maybe that's the key differentiator with Kafka, is that compute and storage are separate. So there are, there are nodes that hold the, the data, the messaging, the message logs, and there are other nodes that in a stateless way take care of delivering me messages. So the broker and the storage of messages are two separate parts. That's a key point because it makes uh, scalability much, much easier which again, once we have a cloud offering for that, once we get to the Astra streaming, is not even our concern today. Astra streaming is a managed Pulsar in the cloud with a free tier, and today we're going to use the free tier. And it makes everything very easy because with a few clicks, you create your streaming topic and you start using that. So we are about to do the first part of the hands-on. I want to remind you that uh, there is a bit well, there is way more information in the GitHub repository README, and also you can have a closer look at the slides. So today I'm going to, I don't want to spend too much time on the theory part because I can imagine you want to do hands-on and we are about to start. Just one thing, uh, how is Pulsar structured? So uh, Pulsar, let's say there is a big instance of Pulsar, which might be comprised of many clusters generally. Anyway, there is a Pulsar instance and this has uh, what is called multi-tenancy. So there might be several tenants in the Pulsar cluster, which are different users, for example, and they will never communicate with each other. So it's a single cluster, but it actually keeps a very strong separation between everyone. So even if your neighbors are uh, the, the angry lady here or the um, hacker, well-dressed hacker here, you don't care because you are a different tenant and nobody, so there is no interaction. Now, this tenant, let's call this game server, which is you. In, within a tenant, topics are grouped in namespaces. Again, this is an organi organizational uh, point. So let's say there is a namespace called IoT, a finance. Uh, in particular, when you create a tenant, there is already for you a default namespace. And this is what we are going to use today. Within the default namespace, there are topics. As I said, every topic is, let's say, conceptually a pipe. You put messages or events on one side and you can retrieve them on the other side. We are going to use a topic in the namespace default. Let's call it word updates for the game, game word. Um, this structure corresponds to, the, to how you specify a full topic name. So persistent, which is the, the, the persistence of the topic, let's say, per persisted to disk to be strong against crashes. And then you have tenant, namespace, 
and topic name. So this is the full name of a topic. Okay. So with that, let's start with the hands-on part. We want to create an Astra account. We want to create a streaming a tenant and topic, and we will uh, retrieve and store the secrets to later connect to it from the game. And uh, not only that, but we will also create a database again in Astra, uh, Astra DB, and we will um, retrieve and, st and store the secrets to access the database as well for later, because later the API powering the game will need all of these secrets to be able to speak to the topic and to speak to the database. So I made myself a bit smaller so you're able to see better, right? Okay, so first thing is there is, as I mentioned, a repository with all instructions, all material, in particular in the readme, there is, let me start from the beginning, this is the readme, this is the shape, the, the, the appearance of the game once it will run. Uh, as I said, all instructions. Also, there is a um, description on how you get, how, what kind of homework you have to do to get your badge, where to submit and everything. But now let's start. Well, let's start with creation of the Astra streaming. So first, there is this nice button, Create Astra. Please click on it and it will bring you to this screen where you have to create your account on Astra. So you can use GitHub, Google, or you can use email and password, whatever, and create your account. Of course, I already have mine. So uh, I will log in. Okay, this went away. I, I have already my uh, account. And I can log in. Okay, so this is the appearance of your uh, Astra panel once you create your account and you have logged in. On the left side, you see a list of databases. For you, it will be probably empty. And a list of streaming tenants. Again, it will be empty, but not for long. Okay, so uh, first thing, create the streaming tenant and then topic. You remember, we want to create a new tenant. Within that, there will be a default namespace, and then we will create a topic in it called Word Updates. Okay, so see this Create Streaming button here? Click on it. And Create Streaming. Uh, it asks me for a tenant name. Now, there is a trick, because tenants have to be unique across the, the whole uh, Astra Streaming cluster, which means that if I'm now if now I'm using game server, you will have to use something different. Like, for example, you will have to use game server 554 or whatever. So just make it unique across accounts. Then uh, choose any provider and region. For example, since I'm based in Europe, so I will go for Europe West. Uh, don't mind this pay as you go uh, payment information because there is anyway a free tier which offers. I guess $25 of credit per month. So it will be very much more than covered. Uh, I mean, today's uh, the, the game needs will be covered by this free tier a lot. So if I click create tenant, create streaming, there we go. So uh, you see my streaming tenant has been created in my Astra streaming account. So let me save this information because it might be needed later so i keep the uh, i keep just a text file with this information okay so I, ha I have a tenant now let's go to the topics tab because we have to create that individual topic that will power the game that will convey the messages for the game okay so topics of course there is nothing here right so uh okay Let's create a topic. So within the game server 554 tenant, I have a namespace called default, which is there for me, ready to use. And I have, I want to create a topic in it. So there is this add topic button. And if you remember, the topic was called word updates. So persistent, yes, partitioned, no. That's okay, add topic. Okay, now 
looks like the topic has been created. Let's make uh, maybe a refresh to check. And if you open here, there we go. You, we have our topic word updates ready to be used. Now, uh, I think I clicked on the topic, but uh, that was not my intention yet. Okay, so we created the topic. Now, uh, as I mentioned, this is, a, of, this is a cloud service. So the topic is out there, ready to be reached on a server. But then we need to know which server and probably we need some way of authentication. We don't want anyone to reach our topic, right? Indeed, if I go to the connect tab here for my top, for my tenant, look, there is something called, there are all details to connect to my topic. What we need today is the broker service URL. You see, that's it. that is the address of the server we have to communicate, we have to reach for using the topic. I can click on this nice clipboard icon and let me note this down. Broker service URL, there we go. And that's uh, to, to reach the topic, but we also need a token, let's say a, a big secret that makes it, uh, so a secret that we need to authenticate and actually be accepted for accessing the topic. You see this token here at the bottom? Well, if you click on Token Manager, we end up in a settings uh, page here. You see, there is already a token ready for me to use, created for me. I mean, I could create a new token, but that's already good. Let me click on the clipboard icon and I'm copying the token. Uh, you're not seeing the token here for one reason. The token is a very long string. So, Anyway, let's keep it here one second. So we have everything for the streaming. We have the service URL and the token, which will be used to later speak to the streaming topic. That's not the end of it, because you see, after creating the streaming instance, we also have to create the database, which is a different thing. It is, it is still within Astra, but it is a different service. Uh, so we have to create the database where we will store the current status of the game on server side. So we start by creating a database. And to that, you see there is databases here in my Astra uh, main uh, dashboard. Le let's click on this create database button. There we go. So to create the database again, I want I have to fill a few form, a few fields. Let's call the database workshops and let's call the key space I think Drapetiska. Let's check. So let me check one second. Database name, workshops, key space name, Drapetiska. Of course, you can use any name you want, but this makes everything easy because those values are ready there in the code settings. So the database is the full database that you are going to create. It will be your personal database and the key space. It's basically a grouping of tables. So within every database you have potentially several key spaces, and every key space is a group of tables. Um, today we're going to use a single table, but that's uh, not, not relevant. Usually a single application will have all tables in a single key space for, you know, to keep everything uh, orderly. Now, um, this is a database in, as a service living in the cloud, so we have to choose a cloud provider, for example, Google Cloud, Again, I'm from Europe, so I will choose a European provider and then, so cloud provider, region, and then create database. Now, the database will take a couple of minutes to be completely provisioned. In the meantime, what, you, what happens is that you, you see in, in your databases dashboard workshops that's just been created and indeed it is in the pending state, so it is being created. By the way, you see I already have a few other databases. That's okay. That's because I, I do several things with Astra. Yours will be the only one probably. And in a few, in a couple of minutes, that should go to the green active status. Okay, so we are ready to proceed. We created the database and we still need a single thing. 
secrets to reach the database. So uh, again, let me scroll to the part, to the relevant part in the readme, just to show you that all instructions are there, spelled out in greater detail. We have to create a database token, much uh, in the same way as we did for the streaming topic. So I can click on, okay, I can do the token, I can create the token in various ways. Uh, the quickest way is, you see this workshop database here in my database dashboard. There should be here this menu and there is, look, a generate a token. Nice. Okay, so I want to generate a token. This time I have to generate it myself and I will store it to later provide it to the API, right? So um, choose the database administrator role and generate the token like this. Okay, so the token is a combination of three secrets, client ID, client secret, and token proper. Today, actually, we just need the client ID and the client secret, but I'm going to copy everything nevertheless. So again, let me store those in the notepad. I want to quickly access them later. I forgot here token we will not need it today again but okay now uh, just a detail you can create as many tokens as you want and you can also revoke them of course um, you see I have pretty many already um, you can also download this information as a fancy CSV easy to, to store keep it as a secret because this is a secret Anyone with the token is able to do anything to your database. So take care. Uh, the point is that when you leave this page, you will never see this information again. So it's very important that you keep it somewhere. Actually, the best thing is to download the CSV. Today, I'm just demoing, so no, no big deal. Okay, so we created and stored the token, the database token. That's almost the end of it. The secrets part, we just need one more thing. Uh, if I click on the Astra logo here, I'm brought back to the main uh, dashboard of my Astra account. Again, I can select workshops database. This is the dashboard for the workshop database. We need a single piece of uh, information yet to, to establish the connection later from the API to the database. And for that, let me click on the connect tab here. You see the connect tab, click on it. And there are, well, various, very many ways to connect to your AstraDB. In particular, click on any one of these one here, connect using a driver. Let's say I click on the Python one, so connect up, connect using a driver and Python. These brings me to this page, and on this page, I am able to download bundle. Okay, so what is the bundle? The bundle is just a zip file and it contains information about a proxy and certificates for the drivers to later establish a secure connection with the database in the cloud. So that's just a file, it's a zip file, but you just download it as it is. You keep it as a zip file, do not open it, not necessary. So if you click on download bundle and then you click on this secure connect bundle, you will download the file. You see, I just downloaded and it is about 12, 13 kilobytes. It has been downloaded. Let's check in my download folder here. There it is. So this is ready for later. And with the bundle, we have everything. So we have streaming URL and token, database, client ID and client secret, and we have the secure connect bundle. This part of the demo is done. So everything is ready. Let's switch back to uh, the slides for a bit more information on the game. And then let's deploy and run the game. So how do the various parts of the game work together? Of course, this is not uh, exhaustive. There is much more in the readme. And of course, if you look at the code, you will find out even more, but let's start. Okay, we have clients uh, connected to a server where the API runs, clients send messages, events, uh, describing uh, changes 
from the client side, such as a move from, from a player, the API receives these messages, processes them, checks and updates the database where the status of the game world is stored, and then writes messages, I would say, to all other clients, to all clients, but that's not directly like that. So as, a, as an architectural choice to keep things simple, to reason bet, to better reason about things, the API will not directly write to all clients ever. It will write events to the streaming topic, and then a separate part on the API will pick up messages from the streaming topic and deliver them to all connected clients. So there is no broadcast communication that is not going through the streaming topic. On the other hand, some communication direct, some communications aimed at just one client will be dispatched directly by the API without going through the streaming. So the streaming topic, the Astro streaming topic will only be for messages that are meant to be broadcast to all connected clients. Another point is that validations happen in this upper part here of the API. So when messages are received from a client, this is the only part that thinks in the API. The, 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 part, the lower part just picks up messages from the topic and just broadcasts to all connected clients, and that's it. So uh, what kind of technologies uh, we use today for that? Well, the client is a rather simple React application, so it's running Node with React. Communication between client and API is uh, through WebSockets. WebSockets are, uh, let's say, a standard for two-way, long-running, connections between clients and server in a web architecture. And again, uh, in the web architecture, there has been a history leading to WebSockets. And back in the time, it was polling. Then it was what is called a long polling. Then there are solutions such as the server sent events. I mean, there are various solutions, but WebSockets are really the right thing in a sense because they have been designed from the start to, 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 to support this kind of situation. A long running, low overhead uh, con connection maintained between client and API that is bidirectional. So both clients and API are able to start to initiate sending data, which is what we need, right? Okay, so in turn, the API will run um, Python code through the Fast API framework, which is a modern uh, framework for uh, running for writing uh, APIs in Python, this will be in turn run by the Uvicorn uh, modern uh, gateway implementation. So Uvicorn will run our Fast API code. Then uh, the database is AstraDB, which is basically Apache Cassandra based on Apache Cassandra, and for that we will use the the Cassandra drivers. And communication with Astro Streaming, which is basically Pulsar, will be done with the ordinary Pulsar drivers for Python. So that's it uh, for the technologies. Let's look a bit more in detail at the messaging protocol. So let's say you are playing uh, in your, you are playing this game in your client, and then you you want to move a player from one position to the other, for example. This is the kind of message, uh, of message that we are going to send, that the client is going to send to the API. So it will be something like message type player and then a payload that is in particular uh, a new XY position. Very good. So, okay, this message reaches the API through WebSockets. The API will validate. So, for example, if those coordinates are not allowed, it will change them. It will enrich, in particular, it will add the player ID, which is an identifier known to the API side also. And this message will be put into the Astro streaming topic. From that point, it will just move unchanged back to the API. You remember the part below in the previous uh, slide. And then the, 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 the part of the API that doesn't think will just pick up this message and send it to all clients. Every client receives the new message type player, and it will update the position of that player. And eventually, the screen will be redrawn with the updated position. So 
So that's more or less the game loop, if you want. Okay, now uh, a bit more details. There will be two WebSockets per client. One we call player WebSocket and the other we call word WebSocket. So the player WebSocket will be actually bidirectional. It will convey messages in two directions and it will be for messages that are specific from and to that client. Basically, this is the part, the upper part in the previous slide, the part that is not involved directly with uh, streaming, with receiving streaming messages from the topic. And it will be the part that speaks to the database, checks the state, updates the state on the database and whatnot. The other WebSocket, the word WebSocket, will be just actually one direction. It will pick messages up from the streaming topic, the word updates topic here, and it will route them and relay to every connected client. Another remark is that um, every message, so there are actually various kinds of messages. I'll, I'll show that in a second. There are different kinds of messages going through in this game. All of them will just be routed to a single uh, streaming topic, this word updates. So there will be just simple uh, JSON strings, so JSON encoded strings, which, uh, well, maybe that's not the best solution if you, if you have an industry-grade uh, application in mind, but today it keeps things simple. Probably uh, in a real application, you might want to have several topics, each one with a particular shape and schema of message. So you want to enforce a schema, which is something you can do with Pulsar. And yeah, that's it. So, okay, message type. What you saw so far is, a, is the most... Uh, relevant message type, player position, right? But there is more. So there are messages conveying information on the shape and the geometry of the game world, on the fact that there is an obstacle, food item. There are me control messages that the client might want to send, like I'm entering, I'm leaving the game. Uh, chat messages going around because there is also an in-game chat. And every message has a different shape, as I anticipated, and they will go through different routes in this architecture. Uh, you are welcome to explore the code and find uh, the various places in the code, both on client and server, where these messages are created, handled, received, and everything. Okay, now uh, a bit of information, what happens when a new client connects? Now, this is, again, uh, this uh, showcases using uh, different message types, right? So let's say a new, a new uh, client connects to the game. First thing, they will send an entering message to the server. The server responds to an entering message by reading the database and sending out a lot of messages saying, the game field is so wide and so, so high. There is a brick in this position, this position, this position. There is food here, here, and here. And there are players here, here, and here. So it's a, stream, it's a stream of message just to keep the client up to date with what is the current status. So again, what is in the database is uh, quickly translated into a, a stream of events so that on the client side, as, mess, as these updates arrive, these geometry updates arrive, the client is able to uh, reconstruct the game status, the game world in its memory and draw the screen. And then the game starts for this player because every time the player moves, a new player position message is sent from the client to the server. Validation occurs and for validation, the database is, is checked, maybe also changed. Then the player update is sent to the streaming topic and from there it will be picked up and broadcast to every player who in turn, every client who in turn will update its word and draw the screen and so on. Again, gameplay is exactly this. So every action by the player will be a change of, of state of the player. It will be a player, player position uh, message that goes to the server. The API will, will validate by checking the database. So food items, what happens if, uh, if the player steps on a food item, obstacle, player collisions, boundaries of the game, whatever. So this validated, message will go to the topic and from there it will be sent to everyone. In particular, when a client receives an update that is on 
its own player, it will also update its own local XY position for the player, which will eventually uh, end up in the player being drawn in the correct updated valid server validated new position in the game, right? Okay, so this point is very interesting because um, if we want the game to work asynchronously as it is, so there, this is an asynchronous game. Every player can move anytime and between the client side and the server side, uh, so between, between this point and this point in, in time, also the clients can do anything. So it's all completely asynchronous. And that usually is the right thing to do, but requires a bit of care. Let's see, something nasty that can happen. So validation, how does validation work? The client is in posi position zero, sends a zero, the server validates the zero, and the client gets back a zero. Let's say a coordinate value. Then, by, after some user input, the, 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 the player moved to position one, there is a one in the client's memory. There is a message saying position one, validation, all right, one is okay. And then the one goes back to the user, to the client. Again, after some user input, they try to go to position minus one. So the message says minus one, but the server side validation fails. And the one is corrected into a zero because you can't go beyond the game boundaries, right? So after the client receives this corrected zero, it updates its own position to zero. So for a brief moment, the value was minus one, but only on client side and to be corrected very soon, as soon as the, the message does the round trip. But then something strange can happen because everything can be done asynchronously. So let's say from position three to position four, there is a user input, but then sub immediately after, there is also a jump to position five. Now, if the timing is unlucky, the message saying four and the message saying five here can just overlap and then the client will receive a four and then a five. But as soon as it receives a four, it updates its own local state. It will send a four back to the server, but then it receives a five and it will send a five back to the server and the validation will work. And so we will be stuck. The client will be stuck in an infinite loop of spurious update. So the, the problem is bad timing and asynchronicity. So as soon as the validation is on server side and there is, and you want the game to be asynchronous, not turn-based basically, you might run into this kind of nasty uh, concurrency problem, right? So in this case, the solution would be to, in, and it is implemented in the game, to introduce a generation number. So if you, if every client keeps an ever increasing integer and it keeps increasing that every time it sends a message, it will be able to detect that the spurious four coming back validated from the server is actually stale, it's outdated because in the meantime, a five was issued. So this four is discarded and the, the nasty spurious loop is broken. And then we fix this bug. So uh, there is a price to pay in complexity when you want validation on server side and when you want real time, not turn based games. Usually it's a good price to pay because such games are better in my opinion. And uh, you should always have validation on server side because you can't trust uh, clients, right? So. Gaming and cheaters is a long uh, relationship. Okay. Okay, so I think you know more or less how the game works. I think it's time to make it run. There's something I said at the beginning, which is this game will run in the browser. So we are going to spawn a Gitpod environment, a Gitpod workspace. So Gitpod is an IDE uh, running in the cloud, so in your browser. It's uh, uh, able to pull a repository from GitHub. So the easy thing to do is to just click on this button, open in Gitpod here at step three. Uh, just a care, I want to open it in new tab so I don't lose the readme. What happens at, at this point? You see, I'm opening this, uh, the button open in Gitpod here spawns a new workspace, a new uh, IDE environment for me in the cloud. 
it pulls the code from the repository itself and it also runs a bit of initial uh, configuration scripts that we configured to uh, install dependencies and prepare the environment. So this is all good and done and, and easy because it's a I don't have and I don't have to do anything. I just wait a few seconds. In the meantime, let's see. Um, okay, so the the Gitpod interface. I'll show that to you. If you ever used uh, Visual Studio Code, that's probably very much familiar to you. There is a file browser on the left. There is uh, a console on the bottom. Actually, there are more consoles in this case. We configured Gitpod to have more than one console because they will be needed. And you see here on the rightmost part of this panel, you can switch between consoles. There is, in particular, there is a console that uh, is called Setup API and one that is called Setup Client. Uh, okay, it's dependencies are still running. Okay, we're done. So this is the client one, and it is will uh, here we will run the client, so the um, React application that is the game client on the setup API console here. We will we will run. Maybe I can try to make everything a bit bigger to see. That might work better for on screen. This is the API, and it will uh, run the Python code for the API on the server side. Okay, so. Um, We have a few things to do before just running the code. Of course, we have to provide all the secrets to the API. So the first thing we have to, so the first thing you see there is this, uh, okay, let's let's look at the API directory. There is a .emv sample file. Let's copy it. So maybe here we instruct to do a copy. Anyway, uh, I'm copying. So I am in the API console here, this one. I'm in the subdirectory API, of course. Let me copy the .env file to the sample .env to an actual .env file. I can close the, the sample and I can open .env. So here in this file, I have to provide, you see, streaming tenant, streaming service URL, and Astra streaming token. Okay, so let's... Streaming tenant for me was game server 554. So I'm writing these secrets here in the end file and they will be picked up automatically as soon as I start the API. So all secrets will be provided here. I just want to put my very long uh, streaming token, which is a different thing than the Astra DB token. There we go. This is probably something I don't have to change. These probably we don't want to change unless you got creative with the naming. Okay, so uh, so this works like a text editor, of course. This is, again, a very simple text editor. You don't even need to save. Every change will be saved automatically. Now it's time to copy the database secrets. So client ID, which will work as username. Client ID here, client secret here, which is a different thing, and I want to copy it. You see, I'm keeping the quotes. DB key space, I kept this default Drapetiska, and there is just one thing more to do here. I have to give the bundle, but the bundle is in my machine. I want to put the bundle on Gitpod, right? Along with the rest of the, of the IDE. And that's very simple because I just drag and drop from my computer over to here. There we go. So now the bundle is here. If you want to make sure the bundle is here, there are uh, instructions to check. So if you do these, basically it's an ls command, nothing fancy. Oh. Okay, so you see I'm doing ls minus lh, whatever, and there we go. So these, as a check, you might want to check that this is actually 12, 13 case. Okay, so this is the full path to my um, secure connect bundle. Let's copy it. I'm going to .env and I'm writing it here. 
it, it was already the default choice, but make sure this is the full path to your bundle as you get from this LS. Okay, so .env file is all right. It says it gives all secrets and everything is good to start, I guess. Okay, we can start the API. So make sure you are in the API directory. Every Python dependency, as you see here, has already been installed by this startup uh, script for uh, Gitpod. And you just have to run uvicorn api colon app. So let's do that. uvicorn api app. There we go. Okay, looks like the API is running. Let's, let's leave it running for a second. Uh, as a remark, we are using Gitpod um, IDE offered in the cloud, nothing to install, etc. But nothing prevents you from running locally. And indeed, in the readme, you find all instructions covering also the case where you want to run locally, install dependencies, everything. So just keep that in mind if you are more comfortable running locally. Okay, so client. Okay, the API is there waiting for me, no problem. Let's move to the client. Actually, the client code is already. There's no need for a setup of any kind. So we just need... Okay, actually, I, I lied because I we already installed every dependency, but uh, as a, it has a teaching value to remind you that you probably want to run npm install to have node package manager make sure every dependency is installed. You see, it didn't do anything. That's because we run it already, so we 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 cheated. Okay, so the only thing to do to start the client is npm start. And there we go. This will build and expose the client of the game in this mini browser window within Gitpod. Now, that's all good, all right, and the client is ready to start. Uh, by the way, okay, the client will need uh, to know how to connect to the API, but this is luckily, this is done automatically for us. The client is able to construct uh, the address for the API. Again, there are some tricks connected with Gitpod, which are not present. So it's a slightly different if you run locally on your machine, but again, this is covered in the readme, so I will not uh, dwell on this too much. But you know what? I prefer to run these in a, in a bigger tab because I want to see the game in its full glory. So I copy this address, which you can also... So, uh, okay, so this is a Gitpod trick. Um, the client is running at localhost on, a, on port 3000, but GitHub makes ports on your instance available as uh, domains themselves, as you see here. And if you want to know what is... So you go to this first unused console here. And if you want to know what is the full address of your port 3000, you can just run gp url 3000, and there we go. So this is exactly the address that was automatically opened in this tab. So anyway, if, you, if for some reason this uh, mini browser does not open, you just do gp url 3000 in, uh, in this new unused uh, shell and you open this link in a new tab. And there we go. So this is my game. So your name, you can write whatever you want. Uh, by default, it draws randomly from a database of uh, either names, of course. So let's put my name. Your ID is automatically generated. API location, you probably don't have to change. And we can enter the game. There, you see, this is the game. So in this moment, the client has established connection through WebSocket to the API. Let's see. You see, a, a bunch of log information is being printed saying, oh, there is a consumer connecting to... So two things happen. Uh, the API on one side, it receives a WebSocket con two WebSocket connections uh, with the client. And on the other side, it establishes connections to the streaming, to Astra streaming, to the streaming event streaming platform. And this is all logged here, all nice. You see WebSocket, but also the producer connection, 
to the topic world updates, everything ready. So I think I can start playing, right? So uh, to play, you can use these arrow buttons, but you can also just click and bring the focus to the game field and use your arrow keys. You see, I'm moving around. I'm moving around with my arrow keys and I can't go on a brick, but I can go there and eat a fly. Haha, -ha, the fly goes somewhere else. I can eat another fly. You see, this is the game. Of course, well, this is multiplayer, so later I will try to have more than one player simultaneously. Uh, probably to have a bit more fun, you might want to invite your friends, because something that you can do is you just give this URL to your, well, your URL to your friends and invite them to jump on board for, to game together, to play together. But now let's, uh, let me show you very quickly one thing. If I try to go, so now I'm trying to go to the left, of, so beyond the game field. You see, if you look at this position field here, you see in the upper left there is a position field. If you try, if you keep the arrow pressed, you see it is negative for some time, but then it comes back to zero. That's exactly this validation mechanism, which is asynchronous. So there is a bit of time, a slice of time where my value is temporarily negative, but then it goes back to zero. And this is validation at play. Same if I try to go against the brick, it will just not work. Okay, so this is, let's say, trying to cheat. By the way, uh, if you want to look at the message, you can see here below, well, that's a bit small to see, maybe I can try to make it a bit bigger. You can see the last message sent and the last message received. For example, if I move around, you see, my message sent will be a position message and the message coming back will just be enriched with my own player ID, but it will validate the same. So let's see. Okay, you see also the minus one flickering here for a small time, but that's okay. And you see this increasing generation number. Now it's almost 500. As, as I move, it increases and increases and increases here. Okay, so everything looks good so far. And let's see, uh, you can play the game, enter the game, try to cheat. We did that. We tried to go beyond the boundaries to bring your friends. So, well, uh, I am my own friend now. So I will try, I will just open a new browser window with my own URL. So let's see if I manage to make them on screen at the same time. That might be nicer to see. Okay. Oh no, I lost the game somewhere here. Okay. Okay, there we go. Maybe I can try to, to create a third one. Let's see if I manage to resize the game a bit. Okay, that's not the best appearance, but I hope you get the point. So for this, I don't like this spider name. Klubiona. Klubiona is nice. Okay, enter game. Oh, -ho. see what happens? Well, it's not easy to see, but it's here. So let's try to make this bigger. Oh, come on. Yeah. You see, my original Stefano game just got information about Klubion entering the game. And the new and the newly entered Klubiona ha has been updated with the whole game state upon entering, including my uh, original Stefano player. I would like to add a new one because why not, right? So, Valkenaria, Brepante Ceratinella, Keracanzium, which, by the way, is this one. So, let's play Keracanzium here. Again, okay, this will just keep here, but let me go to this one. Okay, you see. Okay, you see? Three players are here, and guess what happens if I move my own Stefano player? Ta-da! You see, you see on on the other window here, the the spider is moving around. Okay, not only that, but there is mm, a chat message. So hello, everyone. And you go to the other players, and you see that Stefano has sent 
something. So everything seemed to work. Great. Great. So I think there is time to play a bit more, to, to just round up a bit, because, uh, okay, maybe I can bring the game back to docking here. Something that you can't do with Astra, okay, now I've been logged out by lack of activity, but something that you can do from, okay. Uh, let's see. Something that you can do from uh, the Astra UI, the Astra streaming UI, is to directly put your hands and get your hands dirty with the contents flowing through the topic, which is, well, funny at least, but most likely it is very useful for debugging. So let's see, let's go to my game server. I'll show that to you. Game server topics here. Oh, even more, try me. You see this try me tab? Go to this try me and you will be able to connect to the topic. Let's see. Default, word updates, word updates. I think consume should be good. Let's see. And there we go. Okay, so, uh, ah, okay, I want one, let me undock this again, make it smaller. Because there are some nice tricks that you can do with these. So let me move my player a bit. Oh, oh, you see, every time I make a move, this interface is, let's say, a debug, a probe attached to the topic, and we are seeing the messages being created as they so we are seeing the messaging flow through the topic as they are being created. So let's write a, a, a chat item. Hello. You see, this is the shape of the message as it is consumed from the topic. But it's a fan out. So everyone is consuming from the topic at the same time. So the message is delivered to all clients, as you might re remember. Okay, so I think you can also do something fancier you can paste a fake chat message in the uh, in this test interface let me send this and guess what this message has been seen as a genuine message indeed phantom says boo but there is no phantom so this is us right meddling with with the game system i can do something even funnier so I can send a message. I can pretend the existence of a brick in the game. You see, there is a phantom brick now. You see, I, I put a phantom brick at position zero, zero, and you can see it here. But let me go to it. Let me go to it with my spider. So this is a real brick. It is known to the server. There is no, there is no way I can go there. But here, I can, because there is no brick. It is just a fake message. It, there is no, so I, I've been introducing a misalignment between the streaming, the messages, and the actual state stored on database. And it is the latter that is used for validation. So I can actually walk with walk in the brick. Why not? Okay, so seriously, this is a good uh, tool for debugging, of course. Uh, another thing that you might want to do is you can want to look at the database. So let's go to the workshops database here. Well, this is just for fun. There is a console that allows to do queries on the database directly with the browser. Well, that uses the CQL query language. That is the language to query Cassandra databases. Now, there is, of course, no time to go much in detail. Maybe I can try to make this a bit bigger. Uh, maybe something like these might be even better full screen. Okay, so again, no time to go much in detail, but just, you see, select splat from uh, objects by game ID. There we go. You see, there is a lot of stuff. There are three players, Clubiona, Stefano, and Keira Cantium, and each one with the coordinates. There are food items, which are the flies, and there are a lot of bricks you will not find the phantom brick here because that's the database, that's the truth, the validation truth used by the API. But if you move 
Okay, I, I think I lost my player, my game window again. If I move my, my character here somewhere else, and if you look again, you see I was 0, 0, but if I run this square again, I'm now 3, 6, because I moved. So this is a direct glance at what happens on the database. Of course, there is also a game ID field, and if I start the API anew, there will be a new game with a different game ID, so a different partition, but this is really going too far away. This is related to the wonderful topic of how uh, Cassandra, how AstroDB stores data, but this is leading us too far. Okay, so um, I want to show you the homework instructions. Well, that's something that I will remind you with, with the closing part, but you see, let me leave the game. Okay, I left the game. By the way, what happens to the other? Well, the other screens do not show me anymore. So Stefan is really gone. If I if Kara Kansim also leaves, and I then enter as Stefano 2, I will not see Kara Kansim. There will be only Clubiona because there is this consistent persistence on database which is used to send updates back. So what I wanted to show is that you see when I enter, there is no nothing from the API like welcome to the game. And even, so this is one part of the homework. As a homework, uh, you are required to make the API send out a greeting message as a new player enters. Uh, there are detailed instructions in the readme on where to go in the code. And another thing is that you see this name be below the spider, it is always black. And uh, the, part, the, the client side part of the homework is to make is to, to make this name the same color as the spider. So green for myself and pink for all other players. So this is the homework. You will see, you will find instructions in the readme. Here you see probably there is a picture showing how it should look. So welcome to the game here and the names in color. Okay, so uh, Maybe we might spend a little time showing uh, some features uh, in the code. Okay, so client ver client side. Uh, basically, this is a very simple React application. Um, this is a schematic uh, picture representing the code. There are variables for the web sockets. There is a big app uh, function here. It is React functional. So there are states and references. Uh, more on that later. And then there are a bunch of effects uh, that react to changes, for example, to the in-game state, and they open the WebSocket and do similar uh, things. The shape of the interface, which is admittedly not the state-of-the-art web design uh, level, <laughs> uh, this is not really my skill. Um, well, here you see the structure of uh, the game, and you can map every part to, in, to individual components here in the game. In particular, the game area is uh, is uh, rendered using SVG. But before going going to that, uh, let's stay on client side because there's a point, uh, a relevant point that might be of interest. WebSocket work by subscribing to events. So with WebSocket, what you do is um, you attach a function with this. You see this word WebSocket dot on message and you, you set this value to a function of the event. But inside this on message, so what happens on the client side when we receive a new message from the server? We want to do all sorts of things. In particular, we want to have access to, for example, generation number, because we want to do, you remember this validation, whether the message from the server is uh, still relevant or it is outdated. We want to read generation, but generation is a React state. And there's a trick, because if you just use generation as it is, you are closing over a React state and you will not get the updated value. So you need to do this nice trick. You need to create a, what is called in React as a reference. You see, I declare a generation ref that is a React reference. And then I attach this reference to generation. And then within the WebSocket uh, callback, I can access the latest value of generation with generation ref dot current. So don't forget that because otherwise it will lead to uh, nasty bugs. 
a few words on FastAPI. FastAPI is very cool. It's a modern uh, framework for writing APIs in Python. It's a uh, low boilerplate. It's natively supporting the modern Python async await uh, paradigm. It supports WebSockets, which is very important for us today, of course. And which is not a secondary point, it is very well documented. So the documentation is awesome. Uh, within FastAPI, you, uh, how do you write APIs? You write functions, which are usual, ordinary Python functions, and usually through decorators, you attach them to HTTP endpoints. Easy. What do you do for WebSockets? Something very similar. There is a WebSocket decorator, as you see here, and that, here I'm saying, this function word ws root is attached to, web, to the WebSocket called ws word client ID. So once the WebSocket connection is initiated from the client to the API, this function will start running and it will keep running long term until the WebSocket is closed. Uh, so during the life of this function, there is an instance of this long running function for each individual client that connects. And this function will keep running and it will, in this case, there is a very easy while true loop. And every time something happens here, so this is, uh, here we, we send the text to the WebSocket. And in the meantime, here we, we keep listening on the Pulsar uh, topic, we, we get new messages from the Pulsar topic, and if there are messages, we send them to the web socket, and then the loops start again. So every client corresponds to an instance of this function running, which is tailored to sending new updates from the web, from, from the Pulsar function over to that client. So this is more or less the, the logic of how you handle web sockets in um, in FastAPI and how you connect to Pulsar functions on the other hand. Speaking of Pulsar functions, there is a Python driver that is documented and you can see also on the, on the Astro streaming UI there are instructions on how to use it. Um, here you see there are some instructions, some code snippets which are prepared for you with your own individual values for token and stuff. Um, Unfortunately, there is a trick to apply because even though WebSocket, sorry, uh, Pulsar, Pulsar drivers in Python support um, callbacks, so you can have uh, you can attach callback functions to arrival of new messages. This unfortunately does not play well with the um, event loop inherent in the async await how FastAPI uses that. So to make this game work, uh, we had to basically introduce a loop with a small sleeping time and uh, convert an exception in a, in a null result to be able to use this receiver none within the loop of the WebSocket uh, endpoint function. The last point I want to show, and you will see, you will be able to track that into the code base itself. The last point I want to show is uh, the game field, as I anticipated, is an SVG, is rendered as an SVG but you have seen that uh, there are sprites basically. So the spider, the bricks and everything is, uh, they are sprites that are going to be used in several positions in the game field. So to implement something similar to sprites, what we do is we define patterns at the beginning of the SVG. So this is the full, this whole screen is the full SVG as created by the React uh, function that is rendering the field. It is a big SVG and at the beginning of it we have a few patterns which map to particular uh, SVG files served by uh, the, the React application as static files. And then in several positions within the, the, the rendering of the actual game field, we create rectangles and we fill them with a particular uh, pattern with this syntax, and this will basically make for sprites in the game. Okay, so, well, this game is, of course, not completed. You might start to have several topics and in, in introduce schemas to better for a better validation of the messages, for example. You might want to automate 
database persistence directly from the, from the pulsar, uh, from the data flowing in the messages system with a connector known as a sync, which is offered by Pulsar. And it is also, there is a connector from Pulsar to Cassandra, which is from streaming, from Astro Streaming to AstroDB as well. And of course, you might want to have more fancy ways to apply what is called speculative client-side rendering. So let's say to give the impression of real time, even in the face of latencies of uh, the, the backend uh, part, modern, uh, sophisticated games go a, a great length in making it seem that everything is real time. So they do speculative, they move the player in a position that they assume will be available. And then in some rare cases that will be then uh, contradicted by a, 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 a response from the server. So of course, making such a game with a very sophisticated way of real time appearance in the face of latency uh, is uh, very much beyond the, the scope of today. And I think with that we closed. Let me just show you one thing quickly because there is an Easter egg and I challenge you, well, I challenge you to find in the game, looking at the client code, how you make your spider in log. So you see, there is a way to make the spider display nice hearts. Okay, so that was it. Uh, let's conclude. Uh, I already told you what the uh, what the homework is. The lab make uh, the API uh, send out a, a customized welcome to players who enter the game, and make the names close next to the spiders the same color as the spiders. Uh, once you do that, you can go to the homework submission form. There are a few theory questions. And then you can submit your homework and we will process it in a few days and you will get your nice badge. For anything related to this workshop or even just in general, uh, Astro Streaming, Cassandra, AstroDB, coding, whatever, you are very much invited to join us on our Discord server. And there is a lively community there, so we wait. Uh, we are welcome. Uh, we are ready to welcome you there. If you like this, please subscribe. And I think with that, I'm done. So thank you for staying with me. And I hope you have learned a lot and had uh, a bit of fun. And with that, thank you and goodbye. See you next time.